O presence of love from higher sphere, manifest your presence here, and so here I am. What is love? It is a flow. What is life? It is a flow. What is life based on? Love. Where does life come from? Love. Is there anything that isn't life? Nay. For even though it may seem on a planet like Earth, as if there is something that isn't life, like Jesus just said, those who are spiritually dead. Well, the irony of the whole thing is that you can only be spiritually dead because there's life. If you didn't have life, how could you choose death? So therefore, you can never be really dead. You can only be in a state of illusion. You know that the earth is a round ball that is spinning. Many people still have not thought deeply about this. They look up into the sky and they see the sun is moving from east to west. But they don't actually think that this is because the earth is spinning from west to east. Where you are sitting right now, the earth is moving, and you are moving with the earth at great speed from west to east. This entire hotel is moving towards the downtown area of Chicago, but it will never catch up because Chicago is moving with it. So we have given you these teachings about fallen beings who are rebelling against what? Really against life. And what are they doing? Well, imagine that you go to the city of Chicago and you take the Sears Tower. Now you wrap a large number of ropes around the base of the tower and you distribute them in a westward direction from the tower in the streets. And now you line up all the people of Chicago and they grab these ropes and they start pulling in a westerly direction, thinking that I, by pulling west, they can slow down the movement of the earth. Just think about it. Yes, they are exerting great effort. They are pulling and pulling. But the point they are pulling on is moving with the earth. They may think they are going in the opposite direction, or at least they are pulling in the opposite direction. But the earth under them is moving. And they are being moved along with it. Well, the fallen beings are like these people pulling on the ropes, thinking they can slow down the rotation of the earth by pulling. So you see, do they have free will? Yes, they have free will. Why? Because in their minds, they create the experience that they are pulling against the movement of the earth, that they are going against life, that they are going against creation. In reality, life is life. Love is a flow. All beings in this unascended sphere are moving with a flow of love. There are those who think they are going against it. 
but they are like the people pulling on the rope, thinking they can slow down the rotation of the earth while being on the surface of the earth. Does it not seem like they don't actually have free will? Nay. Well, it may seem like it. But they do have free will. Why? Because the only purpose for this world of form is to give people self, give self aware beings an experience. You can have the experience of flowing with love or of going against love. But either way, it is an experience. Now, you can say, of course, does that mean, as some say, that the world isn't real, it's created in the mind? Well, the world is created in the mind, but it's not created in your minds. It's created in the mind of the ascend minds of the ascended masters who manifested this unascended sphere and this planet Earth. Does that mean it isn't real? Well, it depends on your vantage point. From your vantage point as being in the unascended sphere, it is real in the sense that the planet is there and your minds do not have the power to change it, at least only within certain parameters can a collective mind change the planet. But the collective mind, even if all people decided to get together and try to slow down the rotation of the Earth, they do not have the power of minds to do it. But you see, the purpose of the Earth is to give the beings living upon it an experience, to provide an environment in which you can have experiences. That is the purpose of the entire world of form. So, from the perspective of an ascended master who created the earth, is the earth real? Yes, it is real because it is created out of their minds and they are ascended beings, and therefore they are real compared to beings in the undescended sphere. Now, there are beings in embodiment, people in embodiment, who would object to this and say, but there must be something that is ultimately real. You look at religions, the Vedas, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, philosophies, ideologies, scientific materialism, Whatever ideas human beings have come up with, they have had a desire to define the ultimate idea. Something that shows what is real, the ultimate reality. And these people will say, fallen beings will say, well, if it's only defined by the minds of the ascended masters, then it isn't ultimately real. And so some fallen beings long time ago put themselves up in positions as the rishis of the Vedic tradition. And they defined this saying, only Brahman is real. And the world of differentiation is unreal. And many still believe this. And many religious people think that the world is bad or evil. And they need to forsake the world and get away from the world. Is there an ultimate reality anywhere? 
The answer is no, not as conceived by the fallen mind of something that is ultimate and never changes. We have given you a much more explanatory cosmology than has been given before by telling you about the different spheres, by telling you that you are in one world of form, but there are other worlds of form. There's even something beyond the level where there are worlds of form, what we have called the allness. And in the allness are presences. I am one such presence, but I am not speaking to you directly from the allness, because in order to speak, I am blending my being with an ascended master in a higher sphere who has reached a certain level of consciousness and a certain level of oneness with love. So I am speaking through that being, stepping down the vibration of the allness so that it can be expressed in this world of form. But is the allness then the ultimate reality? Not if you think that ultimate reality means something that could never change, something that is perfect. There is nothing that is unchanging, neither in these worlds of form nor in the allness. Now, as we have explained in the allness, there isn't the same kind of change that you have in a world of form. But there is still change because a world of form is out of the allness. And the presences in the allness can experience a world of form, and this then gives growth. This is a very complex relationship that I am not intending to explain because it is too difficult on a planet like Earth to even fathom this. But my point really is, nothing is unchanging. And therefore, by the definition, of many beings on earth, nothing is ultimate. There is no ultimate reality. The difference between an ascended master and an undescended being is that the masters who have created the earth know, experience, that the earth has reality. It is real. It is not created in the minds of the inhabitants of the earth, it is created in their minds. But they also are not identified with their own creation. And therefore, they know it is not ultimate. It is not never changing. It is in fact meant to change because love, life, is constant self-transcendence. So you can have the experience of flowing with love where you experience transcending yourself. Or you can have the experience of going against the flow, seeking to avoid transcending yourself. There is a flow of love that is real. The question is, are you, at least in an understanded sphere, experiencing that flow? We now come to the question that has baffled philosophers. What is consciousness? What is the mind? Go within. We have told you about the conscious you, pure awareness. You can have an experience of awareness without content. But what is that you? What is consciousness? Consciousness is that which can become aware of its own existence. 
And in becoming aware of its own existence, it can transcend itself. Consciousness can become aware of itself as a particular self in this world of form. And by becoming aware of its current sense of self, it can transcend that sense of self and become more. And this is flowing with love. So consciousness is really that which makes it possible to have experiences. Many other things could be said, but the point I want to make is this. Consciousness is what has experiences. So what is the purpose of an individual self having experiences. It is that by processing those experiences, it can transcend itself. So you start out with this very localized sense of self, and you can keep transcending yourself until you ascend from the unascended sphere in which you were created. And you can work your way up through these various spheres that make up your world of form till you reach the creator consciousness. And in the creator consciousness, you can choose to go into the allness and experience what is possible in the allness. And most creators do this for a time, even though there is no time in the allness as you conceive of time, as you experience time. And then you can become a creator who creates your own world of form. Again, transcending your sense of self. And as we have said, the unconditional can always become more. Why? Well, what did I just say? There is no ultimate unchanging reality. And if you want to really baffle your linear mind, you can contemplate this. Where did the allness come from? When did it start? How did it start? Where is it going? Isn't there an ultimate goal? Isn't there going to come a point where there's no more self-transcendence? Well, all I can say is, so far, self-transcendence hasn't stopped. But I can actually say that it never will. There is no never. There was no beginning to consciousness. There was a beginning to your consciousness, but there will be no ending to your consciousness. And so, why am I giving this esoteric, abstract teaching when other masters have given you more practical teachings about clearing the heart. Well, because what have people done on earth? As I said, the fallen beings have attempted to create something ultimate. Why is that? Because they have rebelled against constant self-transcendence wanting to stop their sense of self at a certain stage where they felt they had great power and control. For example, they were the almighty leaders on a certain planet. So you can, as a result of free will, 
go into the state of mind where you decide that you want to try and stop, or at least you want to experience that self-transcendence has stopped. And you are allowed to have that for a time. But how can you have that experience when the reality is that everything is moving? How can you have the experience that you are moving against the revolving of the earth? You can only have it in the mind when you create an illusion on top of the reality projected from the ascended level. And this is perfectly fine. You are allowed to have that experience. But in order to have that experience, you must create some kind of belief system that has something that is ultimate. Look at these religions. God Almighty, the Almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God up there in the sky, who actually, by some cosmic coincidence, seems to look like an old man with a beard. Yeah? Show me an old man with a beard who is almighty. Maybe then we can talk. But you see, you must create this sense that there is something ultimate in order to stop the experience of self-transcendence. And so, what is it that closes the heart? Well, part of it, of course, beyond what has been said by other masters, is this belief in something ultimate. Because as Jesus said, when the heart is open, you experience the one mind. And in a horizontal way, the Christ mind is the connecting link between all people. But in a vertical way, the one mind is a link between every self-aware being in this world of form and the whole, the creator. And the whole is constantly transcending itself. And therefore, the Christ mind is meant to give you the experience that you are part of the whole, part of the flow. And so when you open your heart to the Christ mind, you experience that flow. How can you shut the heart so you don't experience the flow, but think you are in some static situation that can be prolonged over time? You'll only cry creating the belief in something ultimate, something absolute, the absolute truth. This is an extremely subtle and powerful belief on earth, promoted by so many religions, philosophies, thought systems, ideologies, and even the so-called scientific materialism. But science in its pure form is a flow, constantly looking to expand the knowledge. And mysticism and spirituality in its pure form is a flow, constantly seeking to transcend the self. So when you have taken this belief in something ultimate and taken it into your heart chakra, it forms a very powerful lock that closes the valves in the heart chakra. So there comes a point on your upward path towards freedom, inner freedom, where you need to step back and look at your life, look at your mind, and consider, what beliefs do I have in something ultimate. What ideas have I taken in in this lifetime or in past lifetimes of something ultimate? 
this messenger many years ago started reading between the lines of the Ascended Master teachings of a previous dispensation. He started sensing that the Masters were actually saying between the lines, mind you, that even their teachings were not the ultimate truth. This is logical when you think of progressive revelation. How does revelation progress? Well, you give a teaching that helps people raise their consciousness and now they can receive a higher teaching. So if the teaching given was some ultimate absolute teaching, how could there be progression? And he started sensing this and he struggled with it for years because he had this belief in his mind. But there must be something that is true. There must be something I can grasp and rely on. And what he was really sensing was his ego seeking to grasp on to something unchanging so that it didn't have to transcend itself. And this is, of course, very understandable because you have this insecurity when you don't have the fully open heart and you're not connected to the one mind, you are seeking some kind of security in this world. So you want to believe that there is something that you can rely on, something that cannot be suddenly ripped away from you. But what he eventually came to realize was that the ascended masters are in a fundamentally higher state of consciousness than he was and is. They see a higher truth, but they cannot give that to people in the unascended state because you cannot fathom it from the unascended state. So he started gradually accepting that even the teachings of the ascended masters are not an absolute truth because they are adapted to people's levels of consciousness. He also started sensing that his ability to grasp the teachings depended on his current level of consciousness. And that as he raised his consciousness, he would be able to see something in the teachings that he couldn't see now. But still, he even started sensing that there was a limit to how high he could go through the outer teaching because there comes that point where you can only go higher by not being fixated on the teaching, but by using the teaching to make contact with the being who gave the teaching. So, even though you may think I am this esoteric being who, of course, cannot take embodiment on a planet like Earth. And even you may think that as such, I cannot really give you any practical tools. I will still give you a practical tool. When you have time, not during this conference, but some time after, you might read or listen to at least part of this dictation. But then you take a sheet of paper. It should be letter-sized or A4, so there's room. You draw a circle on that paper. And your goal is to now draw a map of your consciousness. So. You go into a quiet room, you may give some chants, such as the Om, you may give my decree, you may just listen to this dictation, whatever. You go into a quiet state of mind, and then you look at the circle. You close your eyes, you tune into your consciousness, and your job is now, your task is now, to draw smaller circles inside the bigger circle. 
So you first look at your state of mind and you look at what is most important to me? What takes up the most space in my awareness? What is it that fills the most space in my life, in my consciousness, in the way I look at life? Then you draw a circle and you write just a short word or description of what that is. Then you think of something else. What's the ne next step down? And you draw another circle. And you can keep going either until you have filled the bigger circle or until you realize that these are the three or four things that take up the most space in your awareness. And then you can start looking at what that is. What is it that takes up the most space in your awareness? And then you look at why does it take up so much space? Why does it seem so important to you? And then you can consider You can tune in to the sense that this is important. And you can ask yourself, does the sense that this is so important open my heart or close my heart? And depending on how much psychology you have resolved, how many subconscious selves you have overcome, you will gain a new perspective on your life. Because many of you, if you can do this neutrally, will be able to see that there are certain outer conditions in this world, often other people, people who are close to you, like parents or children, spouses or whatever, that take up a very large portion of your attention. And you can also tune in and ask yourself, this particular condition that takes up my attention, does it also give me tension? And if you see that here is a person that takes up a disproportionately large portion of your attention, this is because that person gives you an inner tension. And when there is tension, this closes your heart. So you can now begin to gain a different perspective on your life where you can look at this map. And you may not want to start with the biggest circle. You may want to start with one of the smaller ones. But you can identify something that seems like it's manageable. And you look at this. Why does this take up so much space? Why does it seem so important to you? Of course, there's a separate self that makes it seem important. But you need to look beyond that and say, what is the belief I have of why this is important? You may even ask yourself the question, because what have other masters said? In the end, it's a matter of surrender and walking away from the self, because you can't solve the problem. So you might ask yourself, let's say it is another person. What if I just walked away from that person? And then monitor your reaction. There will probably be weeping and gnashing of teeth from these subconscious selves that will project at you all the reasons why you cannot just walk away from that person. But by looking at this, you can expose those selves. And you can ask yourself, what do I love more? My spiritual growth, opening my heart, or this situation, this tension. And you can then realize you don't actually have to walk away from the person. 
You just have to walk away from the self that makes that person seem so important. And surely some people will say, oh, you don't care about me anymore. But it's not that you don't care. It's that you care in a way that isn't fear-based, that isn't driven by a subconscious self, that isn't driven by some kind of control game. You can actually, by being free of the tension, come to care in a deeper way. But the point is that when you can look at this neutrally, you can come to expose some of these subconscious cells that are causing your heart to close. Because when a person has too much importance in your mind, and it creates this tension, and the tension closes your heart. And you can come to see why you feel you have to close your heart when you are around this person. Maybe to protect yourself. Maybe other things. But when you see this, you can really come to a point where you have resolved the self, you have walked away from the self. Doesn't mean you necessarily have to work away from the person, although it sometimes will be the outcome. But the real outcome is that you take that circle out of the larger circle of your attention, or you reduce it in size. So it's down there at the bottom of your attention and it doesn't really pull on you and, and take up a disproportionate segment of your attention. And then you can work, work your way up to one of the bigger circles. And gradually you can work your way up to the point where you have either removed the circles or reduced them in size. Just to give a practical example, the messenger's wife has had a difficult relationship with her mother all of her life. So in the circle of her attention, the biggest circle was her mother. And it took up a disproportionate amount of space because when you are an adult human being who have chil has children and a life of your own, your mother should not be the biggest circle in your attention. And so by coming to see this, how you may have other people, or you may have your own mother, or your father, or your spouse, that they take up far more attention than they should. Then, again, it's not a matter of walking away. It's a matter of walking away from the tension so that it doesn't pull your attention out of the heart, causing you to close your heart. For the larger circle that represents your attention will have a center. And the center of your attention is your heart chakra. And anything, any smaller circles that obscure the heart chakra prevent you from centering in yourself. and thus it closes your heart. So, you want to remove those obstacles. And when you do, when you, re you reduce these smaller circles to their proper size, the center, your heart, will be exposed. And now you can focus your attention on the heart. And you can, in a sense, realize that the larger circle that are called the circle of your attention really is your heart. Because in a way, you can say that the heart represents your self-awareness in the unascended sphere. The heart, when it is open, encompasses everything 
every part of your being in the unascended sphere. It is the open door to what is this, it is a, what is above, but it is also the open door for your self-expression here below. It is the nexus between the above and below. And when you open the heart, you will experience the flow of love. And you will have fully rejoined that flow. And there are no longer any elements in your consciousness that pull against the flow. Because what is it that causes, for example, a person to seem so important to you? It's because you have a belief that you cannot transcend this relationship. You cannot change it. You cannot go beyond it. It cannot become better. It is locked in some kind of pattern. And you may feel that out of loyalty to your mother or father or spouse, you can't change because they are not changing. You can't just walk away from them in your mind. So you are resisting the flow of transcendence, the flow of love. And when you see this, and see the belief behind it, and decide to let it drop, you are free, and you will feel the flow. So this, my beloved, was my contribution to this conference. Naturally, much more could be said. But I aim to give you something that was both esoteric and practical. And I also recognize the limitations of time and space and that there are other masters who want to express something at this conference. So therefore, I shall, with my love, the love that is both unconditional and infinite, yet ever becoming more, seal you and your heart chakras. If you will give me a little attention, perhaps read or listen to parts of this dictation, I will certainly help you gain a greater awareness of what is going on in a circle of your attention. So with this, be sealed in the love that I am. <laughs>